So welcome. Thank you very much for coming out. Good evening. Um, so today we're talking about Chinese foreign policy in broad brushstrokes and perhaps fine-grained detail. Um, China has been identified by many as one of the most important countries in the world, one of the most rapidly changing countries in the world. But I think there's a lack of clarity in many quarters about where it really stands in terms of foreign policy, not least inside China itself. There's a lot of uncertainty, change, and debate around what the foreign policy stance of the People's Republic of China ought to be uh, or even has been. So I would just begin by saying, you know, for many years I used to teach a class for undergraduates on Chinese foreign policy. And I would always begin with Stephen Krasner's sort of three-way typology of makers, breakers, and takers, right? Where makers are the states that make the world order and shape uh, sort of international relations uh, globally. Breakers are the states that go out to try to destroy that order. Uh, and takers are most countries that just have to accept it. And so China, from about 1949, certainly 1950, until the 1970s, I would always sort of assume or say to the students, was really a breaker, right? Really sought to undermine an international order that it saw being dominated by the United States uh, and to a lesser extent the USSR, which it also didn't really want to see uh, so dominant. After the 1970s or during the 1970s, it switches from being a breaker to being a taker, right? To deciding to accept the rules, work within them, and just sort of uh, see how it can build up its own capacities. And then some point between, I would say, 2001 and 2010, and it's very hard to pin down, somewhere between sort of joining the WTO on September 11th and then later um, the global financial crisis and, and some of the events just afterwards, China switches to trying to become a maker to actually shape new rules, to institute new kinds of, of structures that might then bend global uh, politics in the direction that would be more favorable to China's interests. But is it still that? Has that worked? Is it going somewhere else? I'm not sure. I think that it's very much open to question, and I think we can talk very productively about where it's going, or indeed about whether that uh, periodization is correct. So let me first then introduce our guest, uh, Professor Rana Mitter, Professor of Chinese History and Politics at the University of Oxford and the founding director of the Oxford China Center, um, who has joined us tonight, a uh, world-renowned expert on Chinese politics and international relations. And so I'm going to turn the floor over to him to speak for as long as he wants about what he thinks Chinese foreign politics look like, uh, where they might be going, where they've been. Then I'll speak a bit, and then we'll have a bit of a dialogue, and then open up for questions. Okay. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Bill. And can I just check that this is all registering fine on the, the mic? Good. We're all, all being heard. Anyway, um, thank you all for being here on what's actually a very nice sunny afternoon. So please go out and enjoy it, but not for the next hour and a half, I think. After that, you're welcome to enjoy the evening sunshine. Um, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, not only in the company of Bill, who is a genuinely a world-renowned international expert on Chinese law, Chinese politics, and other elements too, but I see also various people, I think, in the room who have expertise, which I hope will come into the conversation. And I use that word conversation because actually, despite your kind invitation, I just want to actually speak quite briefly because I think it's much more useful if we all join together in something that resembles a, a discussion. I think that would be a very productive use of the, of the occasion. And I think I might go in the opposite direction structurally from what you've done, Bill. You've given us a very important oversight there. And one of the things that I think people may ask, I won't answer at this point, is the question of how Chinese foreign policy actually gets made, mm. because that is in itself, I think, a really fascinating and quite fast-changing question. What I'm going to do instead is to give brief reflections, maybe two minutes on each, on three areas, quite different areas, each of which I think illustrates um, a different aspect of that um, maker and taker and breaker uh, triptych that you've mentioned. Some, of course, positive. There are other things, all of which rhyme as well. Faker is one that's come up on some occasions yeah. too, but we could get to the variations, I think, uh, on another occasion. So the three I'm going to, to talk about, uh, just for a minute, um, are, first of all, something about economic diplomacy and the reshaping of the Asia-Pacific, or for some, the Indo-Pacific region. But I think actually the distinction between those two is, is important in this case. The second one is uh, the UK, because we're sitting in the UK, and I think there'd be a lot of people here who are still interested to know how a country like the UK is, I think, regarded in the uh, Chinese um, framework of international 
order making and changing. And the third, just because I think we have to mention it, so I don't mention it now, is to say something about Ukraine, because I think that that is clearly one of the foreign policy issues where Chinese attitudes are, you know, very much uh, at the moment under the global microscope, actually. So let me see if I can do each of those in a concise way. And in doing so, I will probably make some broad statements that I'd be delighted if Bill and others here push back against so that we have a uh, proper discussion. Okay, number one. Economic diplomacy, I think, is worth mentioning because for two reasons. The first is that it is the aspect of China's international relations which perhaps gets mentioned less than the high geopolitics. It's, it's exciting, if sometimes unnerving, to talk about international treaties and nuclear weapons and all sorts of things which we should be concerned about. But actually, for many, many people around the world, and I think that applies to Latin America and sub-Saharan Africa as much as it does to Western Europe or, or the Asia-Pacific, it is actually China's economic influence that is probably, at the first instance, the most visible and influential, and probably over time, most long lasting element of their international strategy that I think is, is worth noting. And I will note, of course, that the Belt and Road Initiative, a very inchoate term which includes everything from pre-existing projects such as the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which have been rebranded, and elements which are genuinely new, including, I think, many aspects of the um, outreach to parts of Central Asia that have uh, changed the way that the Chinese foreign policy operates. But in a sense, I think that that can be a bit of a distraction. What I want to really very briefly mention is I think that actually the most important element of China's economic diplomacy even now is not its global reach but its regional reach thinking about the Asia Pacific region and unlike some of the geopolitics that many if not all of you will be familiar with I'm not using the term Indo-Pacific here because actually it's very notable that India you know very large and economically growing uh, um, country has chosen not to take part for the most part, in the growing sense of economic networking that China has pioneered in the Asia-Pacific region. And that may or may not be a good idea or a bad idea, we can discuss that, but it's certainly something that sets it slightly separate. So what I'm talking about here is not so much the BRI as the establishment, for instance, of RCEP, the Regional Common Economic Partnership, officially put into motion about uh, half a year ago, I guess, mid to late 2021. And it's remarkable because within it, are contained a variety of countries that really don't get on very well with each other at all. Uh, China together with Japan, or China together with Australia. Diplomatic relations, geopolitical connections between the two are really not good at the moment, not least because of defence agreements. Um, in the case of Japan, the uh, Quad Agreement, in the case of Australia, AUKUS, which go against Chinese security um, preferences in the, the region. But that hasn't stopped the deepening and integration of trade links between the, uh, between the two. And I think one of the moot questions at the moment is that as one of the other one of those networks, the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, CPTPP, has um, begun to come into form. China's application to enter that particular network is clearly trying to fill a hole because CPTPP is, broadly speaking, the only large um, economic network in the Asia-Pacific region in which China doesn't currently play a role. And it's notable that having uh, President Trump having pulled the US out of its predecessor, the TPP, in 2017, the Biden administration, within really the last few weeks, let alone days, has started to outline an alternative Pacific economic um, partnership, uh, rather more broad and vague, but certainly trying to fill the gap that was left by the US departure from the economic network diplomacy of the region as opposed to the security architecture. So that's number one, uh, I think China's economic goals and its regional strategy, and that should be should be borne in mind because it's an all, where an awful lot of the economic weight and growth is going to come in the next 10 to 15 years. The second one is the UK. The anomalousness, anomalousness, that's a word, um, of the United Kingdom at the moment is something that certainly is a matter of great um, interest, to use the most uh, neutral, genuinely neutral word possible I can, can find, because I don't particularly want to take sides on that question in this discussion. But it's clearly of interest to the European Union, to the United States, and other actors who we see uh, in the newspapers and on uh, TV um, and uh, on, uh, uh, on your news feeds um, on a regular basis. What I think is less noticed is that the anomalousness of the United Kingdom is currently, I think, of significant interest to China. Because if you define the UK in abstract terms, as opposed to the country we all live in, stay in, and, and know, I think, pretty well, it's an oddity. 
Uh, right now, it is a major, you know, it's still one of the five or six biggest economies in the world, a major economic player. It's broadly a liberal state. It may not always look that way when you see some members of the government, but broadly speaking, in global comparison, the UK is a, a highly liberal state, highly open in terms of its economy, highly liberal in terms of its values, certainly compared to most places on earth. Yet it is not a member of its major local economic network, the European Union, because, and I hope this doesn't come as a shock to anyone here, we left it a couple of years ago. That is a country in which China has a great interest, because as we know, China has a great interest in linking for economic and strategic reasons and finding leverage where it can with the European Union and European countries that are not in the European Union. Ukraine, if I might flash ahead for a moment, being a good example, as you may well know, Ukraine was, still technically I suppose is, the largest single country, country part, sorry, China is the largest single country partner that Ukraine has. The EU is larger, but the UK, EU is not, of course, a single, uh, single country. So China has been, I think, astute, again, to use a quite neutral term, but I think not an unreasonable one, in terms of finding ways in which countries that don't fit into their regions can, in some ways, be induced to uh, adhere more to interests that China holds. The Solomon Islands, in a very, very different context, uh, is the most recent example of that with a new security pact that will be signed, uh, signed there. Whether the UK that actually exists, as opposed to a sort of UK in Chinese theoretical geopolitical um, strategy, would actually fulfil that role, particularly because of our close relationship to the US, I think is more of a matter for discussion. But it's certainly the case that, in general, the UK currently sits in a rather unusual place. That's one of the reasons why, actually, I think that um, Chinese rhetoric, foreign, uh, foreign ministry rhetoric against the UK, while robust in many cases, hasn't been quite as strong as it might have been in the last couple of years in certain areas where uh, the UK has uh, annoyed or angered, uh, angered China. I think they still think there's uh, the hope there for some sort of, of leverage. And the very last element I want to bring up, of course, is Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine, as those of you, and I imagine some of you here are from China or know China well, um, was a subject of immense interest, still is in some ways, but immense interest in the outbreak of war at the end of February on Chinese social media. I don't know how many people here followed the Wuxin um, Gongzuo meme on um, uh, Chinese social media, distracted from my work because I'm thinking about Ukraine, marking a relatively brief period when actually pro-Ukraine sentiments were more widespread before censorship on Chinese social media, and exposing what I think in general still seems to be the case in as much as we can see, in that the Chinese media savvy public genuinely is split in terms of being pro-Russian or pro-Ukrainian, but only one side of that, the more pro-Russian side, is now more prominent on, on social media. This, I think, reflects a great difficulty at the moment in terms of Chinese foreign policy, in that China genuinely has interests in Ukraine. It has interests in being seen as a sort of peacemaker and a constructive actor in international society, but it also has a very strong interest both in making sure that Russia is not weakened so much that it cannot be a suitable partner for various types of anti-Washington activity. And also, there's a certain amount of material benefit to China right now. China's currently getting or about to get lots of cheap gas, cheap oil, cheap barley, cheap wheat. It's currently pressuring Russia quite hard on the splendidly named Power of Siberia 2, the sequel, uh, gas pipeline, which hasn't actually been built yet, but which is going to almost certainly provide lots of fossil fuels to China at a really bargain sort of a rate. And in the end, and this is, I think, why much of the discussion in Western media in the last month or so was slightly wrongly placed, I think, about whether China would step in and become the mediator between China and Ru between Ukraine and Russia. And my own feeling is I don't think it's likely to do that at all. Is that in the end, for reasons that we understand, Ukraine probably is an existential question for the European order. It is not in any reckoning that I can understand an existential question for China's version of order. It would be helpful to have peace in Ukraine, but I do not think that China's wider geostrategy or economic uh, intentions are particularly predicated on what happens in Central to Eastern Europe. And for that reason, I think that Ukraine is of interest and some concern to China, but it is not, I think, a central part of the way in which that wider foreign policy vision is being put together at the moment. So, Bill, brief thoughts there. Let me come back to you. Wow. Um, that's an incredibly densely packed set of brief thoughts. Sorry. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. I, there's a lot there uh, to against which or, or in favor of which to react. Um, I, I'll take a slightly different tack, though, and say that I think up until about 2017, from that transition point in the 2000s up until about 2017, where China was trying to play that, that maker role, we can identify a couple of strands – 
in Chinese foreign policy thinking that I think have changed markedly in the last five or six years and that make some of the arguments that you just made maybe a bit more problematic. And so I think what was there initially was indeed, as has often been noted for decades, a fixation on security and on security in several sort of tiers, right? Domestic political security, regime survival, then dealing with neighbors, and then dealing with global powers. And sort of that, that security focus, what was also there, at least since the 1980s, and I think this is the notable shift in terms of economic diplomacy that happens really in the second part of the era of Deng Xiaoping, uh, and certainly the Jiang Zemin era, um, is a focus on globalization and trade integration and sort of wider economic exchange as an end in itself, as well as a stepping stone to prosperity for China, right? That the way to economic growth for China is greater integration into the global economy. Uh, that was very much at the bedrock of that. And so that, I think, is what was driving a lot of the economic diplomacy that you highlighted. Uh, and the security concern was there but could be sublimated in many contexts when you're talking about states that were neither direct neighbors nor global powers. Right? So if, if we're talking, for example, about Ukraine uh, or about most states in Southeast Asia, many states in Central Asia, Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, if we use that term still, um, you know, all of these other sorts of, of, of states, right? those are relatively unproblematic from the security point of view uh, and potential areas of opportunity from an economic point of view. Add to that some of the incentives of quote unquote soft power, um, if that's real and if China was really pursuing that, um, in places like African countries, Latin American countries, and so forth. Um, and there's more and more incentive to engage in that kind of global economic diplomacy. I would say in the last five years or so, that's kind of slid off the agenda uh, to a greater extent than I think is often appreciated. And I think it slid off the agenda for three reasons. The first reason is that I think Xi Jinping is obsessed with security as are most others in the leadership group now. And those who had prioritized global integration economically and economic growth generally have taken a back seat. Right? If we look inside the establishment within China that makes foreign policy, organizations like the Ministry of Commerce, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, you know, the Ministry of Finance, all of these are taking more and more of a, a secondary role, whereas the Ministry of State Security, as well as uh, the PLA, have really stepped up. If we look at the organization of the leading groups that relate to foreign policy, which is again Xi Jinping's kind of favorite thing to create these leading groups, all of which he's the chair of, of course. Um, those that are more security dominant and security focused are playing a much stronger leading role than those that are economic. The third point and uh, the second point rather on economic diplomacy uh, or e economic prioritization that I would make is that um, I think that the overall exercise of outreach uh, in terms of economic relations that China has been pursuing has been increasingly concentrated on what's been you've always referred to as one belt, one road. I can never remember even which is the belt, which is the road. I think the belt technically is the maritime uh, road. Or that's the road, the road, road the maritime one, and actually. the belt which, is which, the over, it's, it's, it's which is counterintuitive. Yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, which is but when road should be over land. But yeah, anyway, it's uh, this idea of sort of reaching out to Central Asia and Southeast Asia with economic ties and assistance in order to forge better relations, exercise soft power, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think so. I don't think it's really working that way. I think it's a very convenient political moniker to hang on projects that were going to go, on, go forward anyway, or that powerful economic and political interests within China would like to go forward, right? So if we look at the politics and political economy of investment, and particularly investment by state-owned enterprises and large state-backed funds within China, that investment is too high and too inefficient and has been so for decades. Out, you know, Taking that investment overseas, letting it go out, the so-called going out strategy, going to higher risk uh, environments where you might earn a higher reward, or moving money out of China for purposes of round tripping Maybe bring it back in as foreign investment, which then gets tax breaks, or to a third country just to park it somewhere, maybe to buy real estate in London, maybe to do something else like this, maybe to invest in equities overseas, whatever it could be, right? Doing that is very difficult and has been very difficult within uh, the Chinese legal apparatus for years and years and years. One belt, one road makes it easy. 
If you can say this is a one belt, one road project, done, approved. You move the money right out, do whatever you're going to do with it. And I think that there's a high percentage, I wouldn't say the majority, I have no idea, there's no way to trace it, but a significant and high, maybe growing percentage of one belt, one road projects that have nothing to do with the infrastructure uh, investment that the state headlines. Um, also, much of that infrastructure investment has not worked very well. Uh, hasn't really paid off, hasn't been completed, even in places like Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Some of the seaport developments, for example, in Balochistan and elsewhere have not actually been finished. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been sort of abandoned halfway through, uh, sputtered out uh, more than halfway through. The much vaunted railway all the way across Asia is not economically viable, loses tremendous amount of money. Um, lots of projects in Southeast Asia have been canceled. Uh, a number of Southeast Asian countries, after political changes within those countries, have decided we don't want this. We're going to go with, say, Japan to build the railway instead, uh, or Singapore to build the mass transit system, or whatever it might be, um, in part because they're wary of Chinese investment coming in, in part because they think they can get a, a better deal for a better um, product from some other country or provider. Um, and sometimes those political changes that underlie that change are, in fact, a direct reaction, at least in part, against China's involvement in these projects, right? There's a political mobilization against China in some of these countries that leads to political shifts. For example, um, in elections, uh, in which another party comes to power that says, you know what, we don't want this. So One Belt, One Road is not as effective or as important, I would say, as is often assumed, but it's sucking all the air out of the room. So the, that's the second factor, is that basically everything is being channeled in these very inefficient um, and not very effective ways. The third factor is another one that's very much in the news, which we haven't mentioned, COVID, right? You can't integrate with the rest of the world when you seal your country off. And that's what China's been doing for two years plus now and will be doing for at least one more year, right? They've met now just today made it nearly impossible for anyone to leave the country unless you can justify all of these things with special letters of you've got a job or you've got to offer to study or something like this. Even then, can you get your passport renewed? When you go you to the airport, in the UK either, to be fair, but for slightly different. Well, that, that just inefficiency. Uh, it's just, but you know, which, or at least supposedly benign inefficiency, right? But but the you know, if you can't get your passport renewed and you can't get permission to leave the country, even if you can do those things, though, if you go to the airport, is there a flight? Is there a flight that costs less than ten thousand US dollars? Um, is there a flight that goes to any place that you actually need to go or want to go? Right? These sorts of things are making it impossible for people to leave and go anywhere else. They're also uh, making it even harder than that, even more impossible for anyone to come in. And they're driving out foreign residents, foreign corporations, um, all kinds of you know, trade offices and, and liaison uh, officers and so on. And so what's happening now is we're seeing a, a delinking of China's economy and of Chinese society to an alarming and rapid extent, I would say, from all of the rest of the world. Um, and, and that is not going to be something that can be switched off instantly. It's something that I don't think the Chinese government has an incentive to switch off for at least the next 12 months. And even when they decide... the lockdown. All of it. Mm -hmm. I don't think until after the Lianghui, in or the two meetings, the meetings of the National People's Congress and the Chinese People's Political Consultative Congress, another nice acronym, CPPP, CPPCC, yeah. Right? Do you think um, CPCPC will talk about the TPCPP? Possibly, <laughs> but that would mean that congruent parts of congruent triangles are congruent, right? which is the only acronym I can remember from secondary school geometry, but I can't remember what it is right now. Um, but the, um, so the, after those two meetings, I do think the Chinese government will have an incentive to let up on the lockdowns and, and to reopen, to try to return to the status quo before the pandemic. I don't think they'll be able to, because I think that the narrative that's been sold domestically is so strident, so extreme on COVID that there's no way you can just turn around and say, oh, well, now we're just going to live with it. Forget, forget everything we've been saying for 24 months or 30 months by that point or 36 months. <laughs> COVID's no big deal. You're all vaccinated. You're fine. No, they're not. you can't say that. It, they would lose all credibility. They've spent all this time saying COVID is a deadly disease and a deadly serious threat. And if you come near it, you're probably going to die. And the government's going to protect you with these draconian measures, which we should all support and sacrifice to do this. And, you know, persistence is victory. Right. We have to stick with this. There's no way we can give an inch. You can't just then give that up. Right. So so that's going to prevent China from really integrating economically, I think, for a long time. So those three factors, the general obsession with security, 
the inefficiency of the Belt and Road and other sort of broad initiatives that have aggregated economic diplomacy in ways that, that don't really pay off. And then COVID and the sealing off of China from the rest of the world have meant that this agenda of globalization and economic growth through globalization is now off the table. I think it's going to be off the table for a while, and I think that has a couple of implications. I think one implication is that China will not any longer be able to really follow this sort of two different games mm. of, of global diplomacy, right? You can't be this sort of globalization, economic integrationist, while at the same time being a sort of you know, security um, concerned, almost semi-isolationist power uh, when it comes to security, if you're not really playing the globalization game anymore uh, on economic terms, right? You can't play both those games if one of them you've essentially given up. I think that has an implication for how China is going to relate to other countries. It will be much harder to have <laughs> positive uh, relationships with other countries when more and more of China's international relations are dominated by security concerns. I also think that it implies strongly that China will be less well placed to exercise leadership in the international arena when it comes to things like the WTO or when it comes to building new institutional frameworks like the CPTPP or the uh, AIIB or any of these other kinds of frameworks that China is trying to build. I think with a diminished economy, <laughs> slowing economic growth, possibly a recession and deglobalization as the order of the day, China will not really be able to engage in that. So what I think we're likely to face is a China that's much more isolated, much more security concerned, and much more uh, having to prioritize not just immediate neighbors, not just global powers, but sort of middle powers in the general vicinity uh, as important interlocutors. So you know, a country like, for example, the Philippines or Indonesia will become more important uh, to China than uh, dealing with the UK. Yeah. Um, and, you know, countries like India that are on the border and threats will be very important. Russia that's on the border and possibly ambivalent is going to be important. Japan, important. Um, but I'm not sure that there's a new bold agenda for Africa in the offing for China. Well, just a couple of quick thoughts on the back of that. Sorry, to make sure that yeah. everyone else gets in too. But uh, so much. I, did, I, 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 you know, I think I'd agree with pretty much um, all, all of that. But I would want to put forward a couple of other scenarios that might push back in certain ways or at least provide alternative ways forward. I'll start with, at the end with Africa. Mm. I think it was very indicative and actually backing up really what you were saying, but worth noting, that um, I don't know how many people here were in uh, Dakar, Senegal in uh, December last year. I wasn't. I but many of the top leaders of sub-Saharan African states were. And they were listening at the uh, China-Africa Friendship Conference, which is a kind of fairly regular, I think, uh, quinquennial um, event, uh, to Xi Jinping's speech being delivered by a video link. Uh, because at the moment, Vladimir Putin is the only guy he sees um, in person, it would, would appear. Um, and the message given to the leaders of those African countries, largely for the reasons that Bill says, was very different from what had been said in Johannesburg, the previous meeting in 2016. 2016 in Johannesburg, it was the money taps are open. Basically, our big um, uh, lending banks, you know, the China Export Import Bank, China Development Bank, are handing out cash for projects. Not so, I mean, yes, also the AIB, but I don't know, Bill, how you feel about this, but I think that the Asia International Infrastructure Bank, the one which is essentially run along the lines of most Western-oriented banks, is more like a sort of boutique bank that's there to show that China can do that sort of thing perfectly well when it wants to. But the really big money seems to come out of the main um, state-run banks that actually have much bigger resources and much less transparent books, me, me, me thinks. Anyway, a lot of that money has gone over the five years since into sub-Saharan African projects such as the Kenya-Uganda high-speed rail, yeah. which has not been finished and isn't going to make money, and the Chinese investors are pretty ticked off about it, actually. What Xi Jinping said in that <coughs> message was essentially... The money taps from the development banks are closing off, and instead we expect China's private sector to step up. Mm -hmm. Now that has particular implications that, to be honest, Bill understands much better than I do, but I'm going to give a, a punt at it and you'll, you'll, you'll come back on this, I'm sure. The Chinese private sector is both comparable and not comparable with that in liberal economies. On the one hand, and the thing that people tend to, to know, is that it is much more heavily influenced by the state, and that's certainly true about you know, Belt and Road Initiative uh, investments and so forth. But people tend to forget sometimes it is still a genuine private sector. You have share prices, you have stock markets, you have investors. And even in China, which has obviously huge amounts of state control, 
it is not possible for the state simply to tell the private sector what to do, particularly when the private sector is expected to make money. And you can see this with the you know, very sudden shutdowns on the video gaming sector and online education and the things which caused a huge kind of crash in the tech sector and the Chinese stock market. Meltdown in the property and equity markets Pro- right now. Another fantastic example, yeah. you know, free uh, private markets in China are not fully free. They aren't really free anywhere very much. Uh, certainly not in Singapore, which is often cited by Brexiteers as a good example of this. And Singapore, I promise you, has one of the most regulated economies you'll see anywhere in the, uh, in the world, where Temasek comes to mind. Um, but in China, Although it is clearly very heavily state-influenced, nonetheless, if you keep pouring money into projects that don't make any money, your company will go bankrupt and your investors won't thank you. So in those particular cases, Xi Jinping essentially was, was in a different way saying, actually, we're throwing this much more open to market forces. And you know what? A lot of these various projects are not actually going to come off in a, in a significant way. What it has done, though, I think, is to orient things towards the three areas, which I think the BRI rebranded, BRIV version 2.0 maybe, is now concentrating on. And that brings us to the the other single point I I wanted to bring up from your comments, Bill, which is this. Really, it seems to be concentrating much more on green growth. In other words, the export of technologies that will will provide much more renewable energy. So, you know, this is actually something that in terms of net zero is is very important. We've almost all forgotten about COP26, even though it was only six months ago, but actually it was a pretty big deal and it will be again. So there's concentration on that area. And China, of course, for various reasons, currently has a pretty strong near monopoly in a whole variety of technologies that have to do with renewable energy. So that's number one. Number two is um, the um, digital Silk Road. Uh, We haven't heard much actually about China's 5G capacity in the last year as opposed to 2020 when we heard about nothing but. But actually, it's still there, still being rolled out. Um, Last time I looked, three or four months ago, the president of Argentina was doing a big handshake with um, uh, a senior Chinese uh, leader, not Xi Jinping, um, to uh, talk about the way in which uh, I think Huawei is going to tool up the Argentinian um, uh, 5G network, and it's not the only example of of that. And the last one links in with vaccines. Uh, Essentially, it's about vaccine development. Now, the problem with that so far has been that to say something that everyone knows, the old style Chinese anti-COVID vaccines, which are like you know the, the the ones that are not mRNA in the Western world, so AstraZeneca is the best example, are not that effective. They're not actually as effective as the best Western ones. So AstraZeneca is a lot more effective than Sinovac, but it's okay, but not that that great. This has caused part of the problem, though. The mass vaccination in China has had two flaws. A, that the vaccine itself isn't very good, and B, that um, uh, lots of older people, for reasons I still haven't quite worked out, have been entitled to refuse. Uh, No one's been compelled to take the vaccine. Right, because China never compels anyone to do anything. Austria can compel people to take the vaccine. I don't know. Austria, they're like kind of grabbing people in the street in Vienna and kind of stabbing them. Civil liberties are alive and well in China. They are, yeah. China, well, China's obviously much more concerned about people's personal liberties when it comes to vaccines. Uh, Either that or we know they've been watching a lot of Tucker Carlson on Fox News. So, you know, that could... uh, (laughs) Russia and China's favorite American broadcaster is all we can can say. Anyway. China, one thing, and I did a little check uh, just beforehand, is that I know it's been coming and coming and coming like Christmas for a long time, but China's development of mRNA vaccines does seem to now be entering um, test phase as of April this year. If there are Chinese mRNA vaccines that really work well, then A, I think that that will provide possibly the exit narrative uh, in terms of, okay, we're going to really re-inject people with vaccines that work. And by the way, old people, welcome. You're coming into this van. You're not coming out until we've we've we've, been, we've injected you. So if any old people in China are worried about this now, I'd, I'd get out of the way at, at, at this point. But a mass vaccination domestically of large amounts of the population, whatever, over 75, 80% with an effective vaccine does make a difference. And it also makes a difference to some of the vaccine hubs that China has been setting up in, I'm thinking off the top of my head, UAE, Algeria. Um, you know, Algeria, I think in particular, is currently becoming a hub for Chinese, for Chinese farmer, if I understand correctly. Possibly. Anyway, any Algerians in the audience, please feel free to, to correct Indonesia me. Indonesia also has a major... Indonesia. So, you know, in other words, there's a network there that mm-hmm. could work for that next phase of the narrative. Let me add one more factor just to make everyone really kind of, you know, sit up <laughs> this uh, on this sunny May evening. Everyone in the world is now beginning to wonder who is going to be president of the United States on uh, whatever, say, 18th of January 2025. Mm-hmm. And that discussion is certainly, I, I'm not in those rooms, but I will bet you that there is lots of discussion about that in Beijing. Mm-hmm in think tanks and in the foreign ministry. Because if, as is perfectly plausible, either Donald Trump or a highly isolationist Republican of some variety, of whom there are several in the running, does decide to take or does take up office at that stage and essentially decides to reorient US foreign policy, you wouldn't need a complete reversion to Trump version 1.0. You wouldn't need to sort of have a you know reversal from the, the current 
not quite the TPP that's being put forward um, by, by the Biden administration. But you would get an awful lot of things that would change quite fast. And I think if you want to look at one pivot point, if you can think of Chinese foreign policy in the mid-2020s as being shaped, A, by vaccine success, both domestically and internationally, that changes that COVID narrative, if it chooses to do so, and B, a presidency of the United States that leads to a more isolationist international outlook. I think that that makes a big difference in terms of what happens about mm. three or four years from now. Wow. Okay. Let me just respond very, very quickly, <laughs> okay. and then we'll open it up, yeah, yeah, yeah. if that's so. Unless you no, no, want no, to no, respond please. to the no, response. No, no, no. I'll, I'll but the, first on Africa, I think that, that you know, I've thought for a long time that there are really three different ways in which China is approaching African countries when it comes to economic diplomacy. Right? One is development aid to old friends. Right? So long-standing friends of China that are sort of African socialist countries, thinking particularly of Tanzania, but, but many other countries, Zambia, Mozambique, some other Zimbabwe, countries. Zimbabwe, I think. Zimbabwe as well, yes. Um, although it's more complex than Zambia and Zimbabwe for other reasons. But um, countries that have long-standing good relations with China uh, and are seen by the Chinese government as sort of friendly in political terms uh, receive development assistance. Uh, for healthcare, for transportation, for education, for various kinds of other things, right? Um, then you have resource uh, extractive industries going into places where other countries don't necessarily want to go, right? So places like dangerous areas uh, where it's dangerous to operate uh, in Sudan or in Nigeria, right? Where European or American companies don't want to be because it's too costly or too dangerous. Chinese companies that are locked out of the easier, less dangerous places, right, because they've all been already taken up by, by the other major companies, uh, go into those places in order to seek those resources. Right? So we see this sort of natural resource uh, investment in, in places like that, also in places like Zambia, um, to get at, for example, copper um, or other key resources in Angola, uh, in Sudan, and a number of countries. right. Uh, and then we see this sort of private sector uh, development where it's about textile companies or it's about construction companies bidding because they can actually submit a competitive bid and win business there that will make the money. Um, and those accepting the bids are happy to accept those bids because they're the lowest bids, right? If you want to build something in whatever country, whatever city in Africa, you go with the Chinese company uh, that will build it for you for less money at a higher quality than anybody else. Um, and the Chinese company makes money. What I think you're saying, and what I agree with you 100%, is that the economically driven private sector kinds of business investment is not doing as well now as it had been, say, 10 years ago or 15 years ago or even five years ago. And I think that has to do in part with changing cost structures within China as well as other competitors coming online, right? Other countries, other companies in other parts of the world indeed in many countries in Africa itself mm -hmm. um, that can do these kinds of projects that can sell and purchase these kinds of products for better terms than what, what Chinese companies can offer. So I think that that private sector investment isn't going to last forever. The resource extractive investment is largely tapped out, right? Those resources that need to be extracted that are really that attractive have already been right. cornered. Uh, now in the more dangerous and costly places by the Chinese companies that couldn't do them in the easier and cheaper places um, because others had gotten there first, right? They've now gotten to the last places where those are. So there isn't going to be a big upswing of that. And this other kind of you know, development assistance for purposes of cementing friendships and building soft power is breaking. Uh, it's sort of ending now. Uh, it's no, no more soft loans kind of thing. I agree, so I agree completely with that. Um, on the point of uh, vaccines and vaccine mm. development, I think that what's interesting about that narrative, why couldn't China have just imported mRNA vaccines or any other vaccines or sought to license them, right? That was never on the you. table. Yeah, well, yes. <laughs> but <laughs> For there's no national humiliation. <laughs> but only in the eyes of the state, right? Because that's pretty much what every other country did. So it, it would be perhaps more expedient to do that. So I don't think it's just about vaccines, and I don't think changing vaccines will do that immediately, uh, or, or new vaccine development in China will, will roll out that fast. And I do think it will require compelling old people to get the vaccine, which, for whatever reason, is very controversial. Compelling whole housing blocks of people to move to quarantine camps because somebody down the road was positive last week, that's okay. But compelling, you know, 
auntie whoever who lives upstairs to actually go out and get the jab no that's not okay so i mean there there, there is this interesting mentality around that i think it will take a big shift i don't think it'll happen quickly can you give a one line historical mm. uh, one that just came to me on the back of that that sounds absolutely right for those who know china's uh, the history of china during world war ii a long time mm. ago the Guomindang nationalist government of Chiang Kai-shek, which uh, then ran, uh, ran China, in its temporary wartime capital of Chongqing, uh, was so worried about infections that it basically had people, mostly women actually, standing on street corners, and they would just grab people in the street and inject them mm-hmm. right there whether they wished to be injected mm-hmm. or, or not, which um, at least reduced um, cholera rates, I believe, at that, that time. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure if that would increase or decrease trust in the CCP, though. Uh, if you're to do something like that, I mean, I think that's why they're not compelling people because there there is a calculation being made, I think, mm. that doing that would actually decrease public trust and that somehow draconian non-pharmaceutical interventions increase public trust. It's it's odd to me. I don't quite understand the logic, but I think that has to be the calculus. Okay. But the last thing I was going to say very quickly is if the U.S. government changes... Oh. Uh, and we see the U.S. suddenly becoming essentially a breaker of its own, its own institutions that it made. Um, how would that change the calculus for China? It would have to, but I don't think it's that predictable. Mm. I don't think it's just instantly going to put China in a stronger position or a weaker position. I don't think it makes the world simpler for China. I think it makes the world harder to navigate. Um, I think that there are all kinds of questions that would have to be opened again. Um, in China that now are sort of either settled or pushed to one side because, well, we can't deal with that because the U.S. is there doing this. Um, If suddenly the U.S. changes behavior radically, as we saw indeed with the first Trump administration, Uh uh, when Trump came in, there were many people in China in the foreign policy establishment who saw this as a huge opportunity. Oh, the U.S. is finally sort of sliding off the stage, right? The hegemon is finally fading. We can actually do something now. But that didn't work out that way. At every turn, when China tried to do something, it didn't really work. They couldn't convince other elements of the Chinese apparatus to actually do everything they wanted to do. And the U.S. started behaving in ways that China didn't predict. Clearly, China didn't predict that the U.S. would be so antagonistic to China in economic terms. And in some ways, so threatening on security terms and in some ways, so accommodating. The, the, The behavior of the Trump administration, I think, was perceived in China as erratic. Right. to the point where they didn't know what they could really do, and those who saw opportunity and wanted to advance it were checked by others in the apparatus. Right. So I'm not sure that a return to that is necessarily a great opportunity for China or not. Anyway, did you want to respond to anything no, at no, all no, before no, we no, open I'm up? I'm sure we have plenty right. of time to, to okay. do that, but I think there's so many interesting people here. Let's open up for questions, I yes. Mean, absolutely. Um, questions? Yes. Thank you, Professor, for the talk. My question is, what do you think is the role of history in China's relationship? Say, China, uh, China's relationship with Japan and with the UK. Thank you. Do you want to take that? Sure, absolutely. Um, the question, I'm sure everyone heard it, but just in case, what's the role of history in China's relationship, in particular with Japan and with uh, the United Kingdom? So. Two slightly different uh, sets of relationships, but both very shaped by history. And I'm biased, not least as a historian, but I do think that actually for China, maybe more than many other major countries, um, the understanding of how perceptions of history have shaped the way that contemporary foreign policy takes place um, is really very, very notable. Um, In the case of Japan, I think that there is, um, I mean, you one has to sort of note that obviously the Second World War period is immensely important in terms of the way in which the relationship has been shaped in the post-war period. But I think that one of the things that actually is notable about that um, particular uh, particular period is that to some extent the, the use of rhetoric against Japan and many of Japan's war crimes, notably the, the horrific uh, Nanjing massacre of 1937 to 38 uh, in um, uh, in uh, 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 um, rhetoric that's used against um, China at that, uh, that point has in some ways become quite stylized, by which I mean that it sort of uses quite standard language and it seems more and more to draw on a kind of quite set um, uh, body of ideas that doesn't necessarily take account of the detail of, of, of the history. In other words, it's more of a perception of history than the actual detail of the historical events that I think shapes it. I felt for a very long time, indeed wrote a book about it uh, called China's Good War, that the most important thing that 
China's wartime history really does in the present day is not tell us that much about China's relationship with Japan, but more about China's relationship with itself. Because if you think about something like, uh, how many people here have seen um, the movie that was uh, biggest hit in China, indeed probably in the world, in 2020, the pandemic year, the movie Ba Bai, the 800? Anyone seen that? I no? heard about I, it, didn't see it. Okay, oh, it's well worth seeing in, the, in, the, in, that, uh, in that case. It basically concerns a small group, not in fact 800, spoiler alert, but about 400 um, Chinese soldiers who are based on a real life incident uh, in World War II who are backed up in a warehouse in Shanghai. They're fighting the Japanese who are invading the city of Shanghai and they fight bravely, but you know, eventually they have to have to give up the give up the fight. It has a lot of resonances with um, the uh, Azov style of the fighters in Ukraine at the moment, actually, as, as, it, as it happens. Although I'm sure the Russians wouldn't like to be compared to the Japanese in that case, mm-hmm. but that's the nearest comparison I can, I can think of. Anyway, why did I bring that up? Because that movie, again, you might know, in the year 2019, when it was about to be released to the Shanghai International Film Festival, was suddenly pulled from all cinemas in China. And this wasn't some kind of little dissident movie. This was one of China's uh, you know, biggest IMAX movies. It was made by uh, Guanghu. Um, it was gonna be you know, a kind of big box office film. And it was pulled basically because it was felt by various people connected to the CCP that in the 70th anniversary year of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, sorry, the, the founding of the PRC, you could not release a major motion picture that celebrated the achievement of anti-Japanese soldiers who were nationalist, Guomindan. Mm-hmm. There's not any CCP communist Balujun 8th through Army soldier anywhere in the movie. It's entirely about Guomindang soldiers. And you can even see the kind of 12-pointed star flag of the Guomindang China in the movie at the, at the end. Actually, that's the, it got censored out in, in, in the end. So the movie was banned for a year. Then it was released in China in 2020 because that was the 75th anniversary of the defeat of Japan. It was VJ Day plus 75. So that was okay, or just about okay. It was still controversial. And it turned out that when the movie was released, 300 million, it made 300 million US dollars at the Chinese box office. A lot of people wanted to see that movie. It still had a resonance in a very different China, ruled by the CCP for more than 70 years, where people live a you know, middle class consumer lifestyle in cities like Shanghai and Beijing. They have no experience of war. If they know anything about World War II, it's from now very elderly grandparents. But they still wanted to see it. And for me, it was much more interesting about what that still says about the kind of very tortuous history with the Guomindang past than actually anything very much about the Japanese, who are in the movie, of course, as the enemy, but are just there as slightly cartoon villains and don't really say very much there, uh, there, there, there at all. So I think that, and added to which, of course, every time a big Japanese manga movie is actually allowed past the censors into China, it's, you know, huge numbers of people go and go, go and go and see it. And there are large numbers of people, particularly in Shanghai, middle class Chinese, who really admire Japan. They go on vacation there all the time. They think that Japan is a wonderful modern country. So the kind of state discourse of hatred is not necessarily something that they, that they share. In the case of the UK, I think that history can be brought up quite instrumentally. So I'm thinking that when he was foreign secretary, the current prime minister, Boris Johnson, made a statement in about 2017 that when a new warship was built, you know, Britain wanted to send that into the Pacific. And the next day, the Huan Tio Shuba, the Global Times, you know, big nationalist paper in, in China, wrote about how Boris Johnson was trying to start the new opium war and that this would not be, <laughs> uh, not be tolerated. And this is a reference that, you know, as you probably know, doesn't make it doesn't really have much resonance to most ordinary British people today. I mean, obviously, if you're, you know, a bit about Asian history, you would know about it. But you can get some, you know, really well-educated people who know a lot about World War II in Europe or about, you know, even the Russian Revolution, maybe. But the Opium War is not a phrase that really has any resonance for them. So this was something that was much more meaningful in the in the, the Chinese propaganda mind than it was actually in terms of starting a real debate with Britain. But that said, I think the things that uh, China is really interested in to do with Britain are its tech capacity, its world-class higher education system. We're sitting here in Cambridge University. I think it's a pretty good example of, uh, of that. Its financial sector, you know, it's place, uh, a place for uh, offshore renminbi trading. And also, actually, its new relationship with the US on security matters. So I think the history side shapes the way that China likes to frame a lot of the conversation with the UK. But the history is not really what China is most interested in. It's much more interested in the specific advantages that the UK has now which might be of benefit to China in the future. Wow. I, I wouldn't add much to that. That was a, a fantastic answer. The only thing I would say is that I think history, in order for history to be important in international relations, you have to perceive what happened. You have to be, be cognizant of it, right? And, and not let 
you know, Germany walk through the Netherlands and Belgium a second time, uh, as, as did happen in, in the Second World War. Uh, but then the, the other thing is, uh, you know, once you've perceived it, it can be ma- it, it's very malleable. You can use it in all kinds of different ways, which is, I think, what you were alluding to. Well, I was going to ask, actually, since I, I, mean, I don't know if our, our, our question is actually from China herself, but what, what's your own answer to your own question, which is a very interesting question? Yes, yeah, sorry, it's good to hear you. Yeah, yeah. What's your own answer to your question? Of course, history plays, uh, based on my understanding of the general public opinion on the Chinese relationship with Japan, I think it plays a role, a significant role. Uh, uh, the role is, uh, I think it even goes beyond the current economic situation. But do you think it's a, do you think it's the dominant role, or do you think in the end questions of geopolitics and economics will matter more? I mean, do you think when you know China is thinking about its whole relationship with Japan, the history and the war is the only thing that matters? When things go well, the economic status plays a dominant role. Mm. When things go wrong, historical <laughs> historical uh, <laughs> elements yeah. plays a key role. Well, well in, indeed, that's what I was trying to allude to. Yeah, yeah. You can you can manipulate history not just in terms of how you spin it, but which parts of history you, you choose to emphasize, right? So if you're sitting in China and you want to say something good about Japan, you can talk about the 1970s and 1980s especially, mm-hmm. right, where Japan became China's biggest trading partner. There were very positive relations. Uh, there were all kinds of cultural exchanges, educational exchanges, and so forth, yeah. right? And, and you can just not talk so much about the Second World War. Or you could indeed talk about the 19-teens and 20s, when the relationship with Japan was not as bad, despite the May 4th movement, um, as it could have been uh, and indeed was later. Right, so you know there, there there are moments you can emphasize more or less, and areas of the of that moment like mm. educational exchanges as opposed to May Fourth, um, that, that that can then spin it in different ways. And on the UK side, I'm guessing by definition you didn't think I'm so outraged by the opium wars even now that I refuse to go to University of Cambridge, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, given that China seemed to be doing quite well a decade ago in terms of integrating and uh, doing very well from an economic uh, side of things. Why do you think there was a shift towards security? Presumably this happened prior to the Trump administration and the antagonism, but surely shifting towards security is only going to make the rest of the world a bit more cautious and make, uh, make it more difficult for the Chinese foreign policy to actually engage with other countries. So, so why now? Why, why this shift towards PLA, building up a navy, getting aircraft carriers. So, I'll, I'll, I'll take that's that first, you, then you can respond. Yeah, uh, so, some of that had been in train for quite some time, right? So some of that's been going on since the 1990s even, um, and you know begins to come online later or, or to take shape in a stronger way later. What I think happened uh, around 2010 through 2014, let's say, in that window, is two things. First of all, some of the biggest proponents of economic development and economic integration um, sort of become very self-satisfied. There's a lot of talk after the financial crisis that, ah, see, the United States and Europe, they've really gone down now. Their their hegemony is over. The, The economic field is open for the taking. right? And now is China's opportunity, and we don't have to worry about sort of concerted building of economic policy and economic diplomacy the same way anymore. Um, that played into the hands of those who wanted to emphasize security. They said, see, we don't really have to worry about that. We can deprioritize that to some degree. The second thing that happens, though, there's three things actually that happen. The second thing that happens, China's own economy starts to really slow down and really encounter some major structural problems by that point, right? So I think we'd like to say that the you know, global economic crisis of 2008-9 didn't really affect China, right? The only major country that didn't have a recession, that this massive stimulus program actually helped and, and avoided the worst effects of the crisis. Well, maybe. But if we look at the overall underlying political economic model that fostered double digit economic growth year in, year out from about 1994 until about 2008, It was based very, very strongly on export processing manufacturing. Export processing manufacturing of low and moderate value added products, right? So things that are not 
at the high end of the, of the technology scale, at the high end of value added uh, scale. So that model runs its course and ends essentially with the global economic crisis. Exports of those sorts of products collapsed. They never really recovered. Employment in the export processing manufacturing zones cratered, right? All of these major problems. And so the only thing that kept the economy afloat in some ways, one could argue after that, is continued injections of, of government funds uh, and asset, proper, uh, asset price bubble uh, in property uh, that really starts to inflate after that point, right? So the Chinese economy itself is a lot weaker after about 2010 than it was before, right? So you get the economic proponents sort of scaling down their rhetoric, Chinese economy weakening, uh, and then the third thing is change in leadership, right? So the new leadership that comes in, not just Xi Jinping himself, but the whole leadership group that comes in uh, after the 18th Party Congress in the autumn of 2012, is much more security oriented and much less committed to the whole agenda of globalization than even the Hu Wen leadership had been. And a completely night and day difference from the Jiang Zemin, uh, Zhu Rongji leadership that had been there in the late 1990s to early 2000s, right? So that that evolution of thinking within the leadership um, by replacing the top leaders, plus the weakening of the Chinese economy, plus this sort of diminished rhetoric from, from the economic hawks leads to China emphasizing security over economy, I would say, at that time. The other thing that starts to happen is parts of the world that China are very, is very concerned about become more dangerous from China's point of view. Um, but I don't want to go on and on and on talking about it. But I think th those things happening um, do push the shift towards security. And once you get into that, it's very hard to break out of. The only things, I mean, that, that sounds absolutely right to, to me. The only two things I'd add, one is that I think I push a bit harder actually on the idea that, at least in the, in the mind, I think of Chinese communist leaders, economics and security are intertwined concepts. Mm. I mean, the idea that you either globalize and become sort of economically open and or um, have some kind of securitized um, way of, you know, be like North Korea or something, I think is, 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 is adapted to basically the belief that you must actually use globaliz globalization to securitize yourself. Yeah. So an example of what I mean by, by that, which actually fits with this, is um, one of the things, I mean, I've you know, written about it a little bit, very briefly myself, but I think people who are much more informed on this than me would say that one of the areas that might be of concern in the medium term to China uh, as a result of the Ukraine war uh, is to be able to pressure a weaker and more isolated Russia into getting China more rights within the Arctic Council, mm -hmm. which is the body, the multi-nation body, which you know, essentially uh, sits on the question of who has rights to you know, use land, territory, and so forth. And it's becoming more of an issue as the waters become more passable there, uh, certainly in summer and maybe in future and winter as well. China is desperately worried, and this is an economics and security question, about the fact that so much of its supplies, including energy supplies, come through the Straits of Malacca, which they fear would be very easy to cut off if you had a hostile coalition against you. And having alternative yeah. waterways, I mean, this is partly by the Solomon Islands Pact as well, mm -hmm. is actually a, a good example, I think, of the way in which you create networks that both create new sorts of economic possibilities, so the relationship with Russia uh, related to fossil fuels, for instance, but also security possibilities that enable you to maximize your options and also find ways to find a new presence in relatively ungoverned spaces. Mm -hmm. uh, the Indian Ocean, I yeah. think. You, know, we talked about, you talked about the PLA Navy in your question. So one of the reasons that China, I think, is keen to try and make sure that it has more of a presence in the Indian Ocean is that the competition is less. The Atlantic is even now, I think, mostly out of court on the grounds that I think that even now the Chinese would find it maybe a step too far to send PLA and Navy vessels in off the coast of Massachusetts, or you think maybe maybe not? Just a quick comment on the Indian Ocean before we talk about the North Atlantic. Okay, well, I'll uh, let, let me finish the, sure. the comment on that, then what do you pick up, pick, pick, pick that up straight away. Um, it's not that, of course, in any genuine sense there is no presence in the Indian, Indian Ocean, but in terms of how the security architecture there is worked out, it's still much more um, malleable, it seems to me, than either the Pacific or the Atlantic, where the security architecture has been essentially set for quite some time. But sorry, you want to... No, I would just say that in the Indian Ocean, from China's point of view, right. the, there are a couple of major concerns that I think lead China to prioritize uh, security there. One is that the dominant power in the Indian Ocean is India, 
mm. uh, to a great degree that, that that is disconcerting to China. India is not a friendly power uh, from, no. from China's perspective, right? The second thing is that you mentioned the Straits of Malacca. Mm. If you don't control the South China Sea effectively, mm. uh, or the North Natuna Sea, if you prefer, the way Indonesia likes to think of it, mm. um, but if you don't control this body of water and you don't control the Indian Ocean, well, how can you possibly rely on the Straits of Malacca? Mm. Uh, as, as, as a key nexus point for, for transshipment of anything, yep. whether it's fuel or anything else. So if, if you're going to assert the nine dash line uh, and try to back that up with real force uh, and you don't go into the Indian Ocean at all, that's almost not worth it. You, of course, want some uh, guarantee that the Indian Ocean will be open to you, even if you're not seeking to dominate there. You certainly don't want India slash UK, US dominating the yeah, Indian Ocean. Which is why also you might use your position as a very good customer and um, military partner for Russia to start really pushing hard on the idea while Russia's under pressure elsewhere that it shouldn't be selling quite so many arms to, to India, India, which of course yeah. currently has something like 50% of its um, mm-hmm. armaments actually supplied by Russia. And Only that, 50%? It's been it's it's been reducing steadily over the last couple of decades, and I think France mm. and Israel are two of the countries, as well as to some extent the UK, mm. that are trying to, to fill that gap. But right now, one of many reasons why India is not speaking up very much about Ukraine is that it's not in a good position to basically uh, annoy the Russians, and the Russians also actually want to keep India on side because it's a useful, yeah. you know, uh, honest broker in a sense. Well, and vis-a-vis China, if we go all the way back. Yeah. Right, to the 1960s and 70s, yep. it was very useful for Russia to have good relations with India because they had yep. leverage against China this way as well. So. Oh, now we lots go. and lots of questions, so I don't even know who's next. Let's see. Let's go to the back over there. You, yes. Um, so you talked about how China's reaction in the past when there was kind of shifts towards a decline of the hegemony of the US. I was wondering, how do you think if suddenly, obviously this is very hypothetical, US would cease to be a hegemon and China was now the sole hegemon, how do you think the international order would change, would it change at all? Do you think that it has a very different conception of an international order if China were to construct it? Um, do you want me to have with this? You can if you like or I can go either way. You go first. Okay, so I, I think China's fundamental belief is that there will not be a single hegemon that the U.S. is not an effective hegemon, that it's fading even as a weak one, um, that there's no single country that can be a global hegemon. Uh, And that rather than having either unipolar hegemony or a bipolar competition, the world is edging, inching towards a uh, sort of multipolar balance of power equilibrium uh, in which China would be one of these powers, the U.S. would be another, uh, and we'd see probably in Japan, India, maybe a couple of other countries as well, Russia, as also important powers that would all balance each other. I think that's fundamentally different from the thinking in the US and in many other countries, and I think most of the thinking in the UK as well, uh, which says that a multipolar world is inherently unstable and dangerous, uh, and that we're likely to be back at sort of 1914 uh, if we're thinking about multipolarity. And what we really need to be thinking about is either unipolar hegemony of the US or some other guarantor of global security, or a bipolar competition, a la the Cold War, that is tense and nasty, but stable, relatively, right. and, and predictable. So if, it, if it's going to be the U.S. and China as sort of U.S. and USSR version two, that's okay. But it's not okay to have this kind of multipolar world. I don't think anyone would say that China is going to be the new global hegemon. Uh, and if it were, I don't think it would know what to do because it's not planning to be that. Right? China doesn't believe that it could ever be that and, and isn't seeking that in yeah, I think that that's exactly right. Um, what, one of the, I mean, th- there are actually quite a few of the wiser voices in think tanks in Beijing and international relations departments who are actually speaking, quite frankly, um, about th- what they see as a sort of overreach in some of the political classes, mm-hmm. where they actually do hear people asking exactly that question. It's a perfectly good question because plenty of people in China ask it. Supposing China really yeah. was, you know, the single hegemon, what could we do then? Uh, and these, I think, slightly older, slightly wiser voices saying, look, you know this isn't going to happen. The United States may be weaker than it was. It's not going away, and it still has tremendous military, yeah. economic, and in fact still uh, convening power as well. There are still an awful lot more places in the world that will take a call from Washington, D.C. than there are from Beijing, at least when it comes to uh, security, mm-hmm. security matters. But that having been said, just as a thought experiment, the question of what it would look like, I think, is interesting and worthwhile, not least because actually there are also plenty of people in China who spend their time thinking about exactly this question. I think the answer would be something like this. I mean, I think Bill's exactly right that 
The US and the Soviet Union during the classic Cold War, and China is sort of the third leg, as you might, might say, but certainly with that classic bipolar system, both had really quite strongly worked out versions of what they wanted the world to look like and would use various different methods of either persuasion or compulsion to try and bring about that particular vision, for good or ill. Um, China doesn't really have that sort of a vision. I think that one of the most interesting documents, because it's still quite incoherent in some ways, is the document put out in November of 2021 uh, called um, the Resolution on the Achievements of the Part uh, Resolution on the Party's History and the Achievements of the Party in its First yeah. Hundred Years. Yeah, yeah, basically, historical resolution. Historical resolution. And it's only it's the only th only the third one that's ever been put out in CCP history. One in 1945, one in 1981 which was basically apologising very grudgingly for the Cultural Revolution, and then this one in 2021. And if you look at the ideological basis of what they talk about there, it's got a little bit of sort of very traditional views of China as a great empire in which, you know, this phrase, xia, all under heaven, comes up, which is a very sort of, you know, pre-modern kind of phrase in, in some ways. It also talks a lot about Marxism and how important it is as a worldview, you know, at the same time. And it also has a really revealing sentence where it says, I can't remember the exact phrasing, but you know, the, the original Chinese has lots of fei and things in it, which is, China is not a country that simply takes what it, um, uh, what it thinks about from the Western world, nor is it a country that simply relies on China's own traditions, nor is it a country that simply follows a Marxist yeah. path. And it tells you a lot about what China isn't, according to the think tankers in the CCP in the party school, who are the people who actually wrote this, this, this document. It doesn't tell you very much about what it is. And I think that's because that's a work in progress. And right now, I think that the answer, if it suddenly you know, you clicked your fingers and that your scenario happened tomorrow morning, which obviously wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't happen, is that China would be you know, very concerned to make sure it keeps ideological dominance at home, as it has now. It will be quite keen to make sure that countries in its immediate periphery think as well of China as, as possible. But beyond that, I think actually it really doesn't have a very strong interest in maintaining any particular system of government, as long as whatever system of government there is, is reasonably amenable to China's overall geostrategic and economic aims. So mm -hmm. when Myanmar was a deeply flawed, but at least you know, kind of demonstrable democracy of sorts until February of last year, China was perfectly happy to kind of you know, deal with its elites and work out how it could you know, work out with them. It was when, even more happy when it was a military regime. I think it's probably happy when it's a military regime because they know all the people yeah. in it and they can hang out with them. And before, but, and now yeah. I'm not sure because it's not as stable. But well, and now there's a civil war, well, against yeah. the Ukraine situation, oh God, what's going to happen to yeah. our investments is, mm -hmm. is one key key question. Because if I'm, if I'm right, in you, yeah, you know, the, the, the investment side of what China was doing is, is very important. To them. But there was no, I mean, I don't have any sense whatsoever that China's presence in Myanmar was a primary factor in undermining the flawed democracy of that time. That was an internal coup by the the uh, the Tatmadaw, the, uh, the the regime, who decided that was what they wanted to uh, to to do. And again, I don't think there's any sense at all that I can see that China's increasing economic presence in Ukraine had any particular influence on the direction of travel in terms of the rather flawed democracy that's existed in Ukraine for the last thirty years. Almost all of the ups and downs of that have to do with the battle between being in on the European and EU side, or the Russian side, China was basically just sticking its money in there and hoping that it would uh, get some some I good. I believe it was Ukraine's largest trading partner. I think that's what we were, at we one did. point. Yeah. Yep. So no, no, actually, at the point of the war, I think. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, I think it had a contract to build the extension on the Kiev Metro, which is probably not going to go ahead at this, uh, at this stage. But uh, I don't know. It may well also be very interested in contracts for reconstruction of Ukraine. Yeah. After the war is, we hope, you know, mercifully... And for over. food and energy and other things from Ukraine. And for, uh, yeah. Indeed. But I, th I think that those would be the dynamics that would tend to shape China's, you know, in many ways very realist in international mm. relations term, priorities. I don't think there's an overall ideological message other than if a country's authoritarian, we're not bothered about that because, you know, why would we be? In the interest of time, I'm going to suggest we take a bank of questions. Yeah, yeah, sure. Not that we're running out of time, we're not, just because our answers are tending towards the sure. more loquacious. I think that it would be good to yeah. you know, kind of collect a number of we questions and then we can yeah. then we can answer them all like as, as a bank, if that makes sense. And then the world will be at peace when we wow. answer them all. We'll see. Which is good. If you can answer all the questions in 15, 20 minutes, that would be really impressive. Yeah. All right, so let's just go around from one side to the sure. other, take all the questions that are on the floor now, and then we'll try to answer them. Yes. I'm curious uh, how important or how, how high uh, Chinese policymakers should prioritize de dollarization, mm. both in terms of economic purposes but also from a purely security uh, concern, I mean, either in terms of you know, Chinese uh, foreign reserves being uh, seized or impacts of second tertiary sanctions. 
Yep. Okay. Great right, question. Could you briefly comment on, um, this, is a brief, uh, this is a really broad question, on the recent surge of nationalism and its implication for the international policy and strategy? Because we see a lot of grandstanding, pretty preposterous, let's say, aimed mostly at domestic audience, let's say. And, um, You're talking about the UK or China? Uh, China okay. <laughs> <laughs> it could be either. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Could you just briefly comment on the implication of that to foreign policy and whether that reflects maybe domestic conflict within leadership between its priorities of security or, or, or perhaps economic development or even regional cleavages between the cities and the other areas? Mm -hmm. sure. Great. I was just really interested. Actually, we have one more question over here, then we'll come around. Yeah. Thank you. So in terms of uh, um, CCP's anxiety over the loss of political trust from the public or people, whatever, so if they worry about it um, when deciding whether to import uh, vaccines, what about the prolonged and expanded um, lockdown in major economic areas? Uh, I just want to wonder whether you want to comment on the role of BGI and the biomedical company in China in terms of its future, in terms of its participation in the testing of um, uh, collection of DNA in Xinjiang and, and it's actually, I, it isn't in the news, but actually most of the testing kits are actually made by BGI, mm -hmm. so they have managed to stay under the radar despite being economically quite prosperous. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. So uh, I was really interested in the economic point. So you said that foreign, China's foreign policy was really driven by like, the behavior of private investors within China. But what about immigrants from China and the people of Chinese ethnicity in, say, like Southeast Asian countries, like Thailand and Malaysia, who hold like immense economic interests within these countries? So how does the presence or the power of a Chinese emigrant population in the Asian Pacific region affect China's foreign policy? Great. Great. Um, with an increasingly confident Japan, um, particularly its proposal of a rules-based order in the Pacific sort of as a counterbalance, I guess, to China, led presumably in part by Japan and also its um, uh, outspokenness about the Taiwan issue. Um, how do you envision that affecting the security dynamics of the Asia Pacific region in general and specifically in relation to how, how do you think China may react to that? Right. Um, could you talk about where uh, Taiwan fits into? Um, that picture that you painted, run of uh, geo, uh, China's current geopolitics. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask about because you talked about China's foreign policy as being something of like a retreat from globalization. But is there any sense in which China could be seen to have been forced into a corner with the fat staff? Say, um, Western governments have been like sanctioning Chinese companies like mm -hmm. Huawei. Um, the fact that. When China tries to pursue economic relations through like the Belt Road Initiative, it's denounced as like modern day imperialism. Is there a sense where China, instead of being selfish, is more just toward realizing what is the point of globalization in today's political order? Great. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if I can remember all these questions. Yeah, can you remember them all? I can remember some of them. So we we'll yeah, I can remember some of them. Maybe cruelly, cruelly ignored. Perhaps, perhaps we we've got two more coming to the floor. So okay, we we'll take those, add, two, add those and two, and then we'll try and. All right, yeah. Them. Some of them are on similar areas. Maybe we can fair, remind so. each other of some of them because yeah, I'm yeah. afraid I'm going to forget no, no, questions yeah, yeah. as I try to answer. Them. Yes. I think you comment a bit more on China's policy or thinking around Arctic policy. Um, Sorry about so what policy? Around Arctic. Arctic, Arctic policy. policy. Right. So whether it's security of, of sea routes whether that differs in the case of the Eurasian route versus the Northwest Passage or the North mm. American route, um, where that potentially is going, is prosperous. Okay. If Russia ran out of bombs <laughs> in, in Ukraine, let's say cruise missiles or any mm. other sort of armaments, and asked China for help, what would China do? <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. Do you want to start, or should I start, or should we yeah. just yeah. take it free form? Or? Uh, I, well, why don't I put a couple in there? We can, you can go start. back and, yeah, back and forth, and uh, yeah. perhaps uh, we, can, we can, you know, sort of vary, vary ourselves as, as, as it were. Um, De-dollarization. Uh, I don't. I mean, again, Bill probably know more about this than I do. So perhaps I should pass it on, on on to him. I think it's one of those things that China aspires to, but it's a bit like you know the famous Saint Augustine. Uh, 
uh, phrase that gets used in various other different contexts, which is, Lord, please make me chaste, but not yet. The problem about China wanting the renminbi to become an internationally tradable currency is that it involves essentially opening capital accounts and allowing very, very free flows of capital, which is exactly the opposite to the direction that it's taken uh, in the last few uh, few years. I sort of think that the, the, the monetary order, the international financial order that China would really like to get back is the one that much of the world had probably about 1973, when sort of the old... Gold standard? No, not gold, gold standard, 1973. <laughs> <Yeah, laughs> that's, okay. that's about 1933. Uh, no, no, no. Post Bretton Woods, you know, when Nixon yeah, yeah. basically released the US from the snake and all of that. But there was still an awful lot of restriction on um, free flow of currencies. I mean, mm. you, don't, you will not remember, but um, if you grew up in the UK until 1979, for good or ill, when Margaret Thatcher came in... Um, individuals going on vacation were only allowed to take £50 out of the country. Now, £50 in 1979 was a lot more yeah. than it is now, but you would get these ads saying things like, you know, your £50 will go further in Portugal or Yugoslavia or various other countries <laughs> that were very keen to get um, British tourists and their, their drinking habits uh, into, their, uh, uh, in, into their borders. And then, of course, all that changed, changed utterly. Um, because it's clear that although China would like the renminbi to be international currency, it's not prepared St. Augustine style to make itself chaste, which would involve the capacity for international markets genuinely to bring very large sums of money in and out of China at very short notice, uh, without government interference, for the most part. It would involve people being convinced that the legal system in China was independent enough that if there were disputes or issues, that there would be some independent method of arbitration. Uh, for good or ill, I think that, uh, you know, for the moment, the United States is still considered just about to be in that, that situ situation. Uh, also, the fact that people, again, for good or ill, believe that at some significant level, the Federal Reserve is independent of what the president says. Um, I don't think anyone thinks, however distinguished the governor of the People's Bank of China is, that if Xi Jinping gave him a call, he wouldn't, you know, basically listen quite hard to what he had to say. Whereas Fed chairmen have generally taken something of delight in having US presidents saying, well, you should do X and Y, and them saying, you know, basically, nope, we're going to do something else. Paul Volcker being, I think, the, the classic example of, uh, of that. Greenspan, to some extent, uh, 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 as well. Opposite direction of policy. Yeah, well, quite. Yeah. There is um, a whole variety of excited chatter which I'm not remotely expert enough to comment on, to do with digital yuan, uh, to do with whether or not various types of cryptocurrency might be the way in which China chooses to provide alternative methods. Um, I think that if you want to put your money in some of those instruments, then please go ahead, but don't expect to see it again anytime very uh, very soon. So I think I think the likelihood of the di of the um, di uh, displacement of the dollar as you know the kind of the global uh, numeraire is extremely low slightly different from that and actually one of the effects possibly of the ukraine war is that i wouldn't bet against a significant expansion of what it's called cbops which is mm -hmm. um china's version of swift the international bank transfer mm -hmm. system and china is very very concerned to try and make sure that um it doesn't get caught in sanctions that are currently catching russia very badly on that but that's a related but slightly different uh, different question I might just add one more thing there and then I had to hand to Bill, which is put the Taiwan Japan questions together, perhaps. Yes. I think Japan is extremely, I mean, it's Mom's question, I think, extremely mm -hmm. interested, not only in creating a variety of economic and security structures in the Asia Pacific region that will push back against Chinese presence, but it's being much more active than it has been for a generation in doing so. Um, I think the fact that it's, it's welcome. It, Japan has been one of the countries that's been having the most significant sets of conversations with Brexit Britain about all of this, but they don't tend to get noticed so much because the fire and fury around the conversations with Europe have tended to, uh, to, 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 to hide that. Um, Japan was the driving power behind TPP. When Trump nixed that, they were the driving power behind re uh, reintroducing um, uh, CPTPP. When the UK announced post-Brexit that it wanted, and possibly later this year, will accede to CPTPP, the Japanese were first in the queue to say, welcome, come on in, guys. Uh, this is something that they consider to be very important for the economic uh, security, um, the economic security of the, of the region, to put those two terms together. They're also very, very keen on making sure that the Japanese Self-Defense Force Navy and the, uh, the Royal Navy and the US Navy all have huge amounts of interoperability. The one area where Japan is, uh, so, okay, and Taiwan comes into that too, it is not an accident that former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, who is no one's idea of a liberal, I have to say, has been given authorization by his party, he would not have done it without you know, them knowing what was going on, to say that uh, Japan considers the continued autonomy of Taiwan to be a vital security mm -hmm. interest. Not the independence of Taiwan, note that. Nobody 
and that includes the United States, is going to facilitate independence for Taiwan because they know it would be a real red line for China. But the continued autonomy of Taiwan to basically make its own decisions, as it's doing at the moment, is something that you know, all other actors other than China in the region consider to be important. The one element, and this is one of the areas where there's a difference of emphasis, at least in you know, the liberal alliance, if you want to call it that, is that Japan doesn't do very much, not nothing, but not very much on what we've come to call in the UK the values piece. In other words, human rights and those sorts of issues. There are Japanese statements on boycotts of this Olympics or about Xinjiang that comes in with the Xinjiang question the gentleman over here had. But you won't hear the Japanese saying that much about it. They may reach the same end goal, which is basically to try and push back against China. But their preferred instruments, because that's what they consider most important, are the security and economic ones combined with the fact that they have huge economic interests in China, which obviously makes it complex. And they're quite happy to leave the values part to countries like the United Kingdom, which, to be fair, particularly on things like Hong Kong passports, has been very active in that area, and on the United States, which has been much keener under President Biden than under President Trump to make that a core part of its proposition to the, uh, to the, the wider liberal uh, alliance. So same goal, but different emphases. Well, I mean, you, you covered most of the questions. Let me, let me try to speak. Well, there are plenty to, more. Too, there were, yeah. It. Let me just try to speak to a few issues uh, a little bit. Uh, on this issue of sort of security, trade, architecture, Japan, Taiwan, um, I think the original TPP to me was notable because all of the countries that had signed up to it, if I'm not mistaken, I just sort of looked quickly at it one day, all of the countries that had signed up to join that were actually going to get in sure. you know not the ones that would be you know sort of 10 years down the line if they get their labor and environmental standards up to snuff etc the ones that were really going to get in all of them already had free trade with one another free trade with the united states free trade with japan the only countries that didn't have free trade with each other were indeed the united states and japan Right, the only major economies that were actually going to enter this 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 TPP pact. So what that signaled to me is this this Trans-Pacific Partnership was really a bilateral free trade agreement between the United States and Japan, an agreement that I thought would be a good idea actually, uh, and that I think would be very popular if you sold it that way to the public in the United States or in Japan. You know, this not being any more than 1980, uh, at which time it would not have sold so well politically, but. It wasn't sold that way, not by either side. The people in favor of the TPP in the United States sold it as a way to contain and combat China. Um, and the people opposed to it attacked it either by saying it was going to cost jobs or it was going to undermine labor unions or it was going to do these various things. None of that was really true as far as I could tell on either side. Um, but it would have had this, this advantage of, of building a new free trade relationship with Japan. Now, when... Trump and Abe had their meeting at Trump's house in Mar-a-Lago, and they set out the North Korean battle plans down on the table for everybody to see, and the photograph ended up in the newspaper. Um, you know, ignoring it, I know you could see all the military officials in the background sort of you know, trying to hide their faces and, and wringing their hands and wondering, you know, what are these guys doing? Um, you know, um, I thought they were going to talk about this idea of a bilateral free trade agreement. Okay, we've shelved TPP. We've won the political victory on that. Now let's actually have the bilateral agreement that was at the heart of that and that will get us all the benefits without having to pay that political cost. They didn't do it, and I don't know why. So I think you know that could have been Trump being foolish, which it wouldn't be the first time or the last time. It could have been, though, Abe dropping the ball. I don't know. right? So it could be that Japan gets it but doesn't get it that they want to push for certain things, but they don't quite follow through, or they don't know the most effective way to get there. And the CPTPP, yes, Japan has been the first to push it. It probably will come to fruition eventually, but it's been a long time, hasn't it? Sure. And it hasn't really advanced that far that quickly. And why is that? If this is something under Japanese leadership and it's a top priority, why isn't it moving much more effectively? I don't know. Right, so I wonder how effective Japan really is as a political actor uh, in this region. Likewise with Taiwan, yes, Japan has been in many ways the most supportive uh, country of Taiwan's continued autonomy and continued economic viability um, and, and prosperity uh, in many respects. But is it really the most effective friend of Taiwan? 
right? Does Taiwan feel secure and happy with Japan's support? Uh, or is there something else Taiwan could use from Japan? Uh, is Japan's policy on Taiwan really optimally effective? I'm not sure. So it's not just that Japan doesn't highlight things like human rights or other things that can be concerns for other countries. Sometimes I think Japan doesn't do very well at maximizing its own interests or delivering on its own priorities. And I think this goes back quite a way. I think really you could say since World War II, uh, since you know, it, during World War II as well, but after World War II, certainly. It is fair to say that World War II did not maximize Japan's. No, defense. exactly, that and and that Japan that made mistakes during the war that you wouldn't expect a leading global power to make, right? That that in terms of prosecuting its own interests during the war, Japan didn't do very well, um, and and made surprisingly bad moves. Um, but I wouldn't connect the post-war regime and the, and the wartime regime. Mm -hmm. But except to say that since the war, really, since the 50s, um, I don't think Japan has been a really effective foreign policy player um, in the way that it could be or perhaps should be, um, even given the constraints of, of uh, the Constitution and so forth and, and inability to project military power. I think Japan could do a lot more in a lot more creative ways than it does and is not always the most effective foreign policy player. That then actually also speaks back to de-dollarization and rise of nationalism. Uh, rising nationalism in China, yes, to some extent, but nationalism comes in def different brands and varieties, right? So I think you know, we've got the nationalism that is state manipulated, as I was trying to allude to before with regard to the history question, right? Nationalism can be turned up, turned down, redirected in different ways, drummed up, uh, played down, repressed, suppressed. There's all kinds of different things you can do in manipulating nationalism. Um, but then there's also a nationalism that isn't state controlled or state manipulated, that is more organic and can sometimes actually be threatening to the state, right? So a lot of people, notably Pete Gries at the University of Manchester, uh, wrote now at the University of Manchester, then at the University of Colorado, wrote very nicely about the 1999 protests uh, against uh, the bombing of the Chinese embassy in Yugoslavia by the United States and in many ways against what China's response was, or China's lack of response from the perspective of more nationalist protesters, right? And the, the, the nationalism of the protesters was actually threatening to Jiang Zemin and to the state. So nationalism is, is a difficult thing to control completely uh, and can actually threaten the state. But I think one of the things we see happening in the current era is that the Chinese leadership is taking a much more active and proactive role towards trying to control and manipulate nationalism in particular directions. Whether those will be the directions that they want to stick with, though, like with COVID, once you've gone down the road a certain way, it's very hard to suddenly walk it back or to suddenly say, well, we don't want that kind of nationalism. We want this over here, right? We don't want full lockdown. We want vaccination. It doesn't turn on and off that quickly. Yes? Can I quickly ask sure. you a Maybe, but I think more more than that, more than gender politics specifically, I think it's more about age politics in that we have you know too many young people who can't get jobs. Right? We've got the upside down uh, demographic pyramid in, in China with too many old people, not enough young people because they stuck with a family planning policy for 30 years too long uh, that they should have dropped circa 1990. Uh, if they wanted to actually have a, a, a balanced and productive uh, result of that. But in addition to that, we've got this, this situation where the new entrants into the labor market can't get jobs. Economic growth is not high enough, hasn't been for 15 years, 20 years, to provide all the jobs needed by young people. So we see this endemic problem now, especially as, as educational credentials have ratcheted up. All these people graduating from university, graduating with master's degrees, they can't get even a menial job. The, the, the phrase I think on social media is "bi yeah. um, gradu yeah. graduation, graduation is unemployment. Equals unemployment. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think there is that. I don't know if that leads to more nationalism or lack of public trust. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe both. With regard to the question on sort of ethnic Chinese communities in Southeast Asia, especially, I think it's important to remember that you know ethnicity does not drive. Uh, political or economic loyalty or links necessarily, right? So uh, many, many of the ethnic Chinese communities in Southeast Asia have been established there for hundreds of years. Uh, and so there's no direct connection necessarily between ethnically Chinese citizens of a Southeast Asian country and anything in China. Uh, and not necessarily between 
them and any place in the mainland of China. It could be to Taiwan or to other, other areas in sort of greater China. What I would say on this is that there has been some scholarship, notably uh, Wang Yuhua at Harvard, uh, who have talked about way in recently, um, others in the past, who've talked about ways that uh, ethnically Chinese communities in Southeast Asia and more further afield uh, have been able to access areas of the Chinese economy more effectively uh, or more smoothly than other overseas or foreign investors um, and have been able basically to circumvent inefficient or um, malfunctioning aspects of the legal system uh, in order to safeguard investments. I'm not sure how much I believe that, to be completely honest. Um, I, I think that that may be overplaying uh, this, this uh, card a bit. Um, I think where it really comes into play is more in the domestic politics of certain countries in Southeast Asia, where increasing trade with China, increasing economic links, uh, motivates in some cases a very dangerous current of anti-Chinese uh, ethno-nationalism, um, and, and sometimes worse, sometimes violence, pogroms, etc., against ethnically Chinese residents and, and citizens of those countries. Um, that we've seen happen in several countries in Southeast Asia in the recent past, as well as in the more distant past, I worry uh, that increasing ties with China may motivate such things in the future uh, to an even greater degree. So rather than being something that binds those countries or those populations closer to China, I think it may be something that actually creates more problems um, than anything else. I'll speak very quickly to de-dollarization in the Arctic, uh, and then I realize we're over time, so I'll give you a chance to respond if you want at the end. But de-dollarization, I agree basically with everything Rana said. Uh, I don't think he's wrong on any of that. Um, and I think that China would like to see sort of a slow move towards de-dollarization and towards, you know, essentially what it did with the renminbi, which was in 2007, if I remember the year correctly, maybe it was earlier, actually, it was 2005, actually, uh, to replace the dollar peg with a basket of currencies. Yeah. Um, and I think what China would like to see is a move towards some kind of basket of currencies for the global trading system, right, where you'd have not just dollars dominating everything, but maybe you know, euros and yen and maybe even pounds, um, if the UK counts for anything anymore, uh, but also then, of course, your MMB. Um, now, that agenda, I think, had been moving along from about 2005, 2007-ish, up until about 2014-15. I think it really went askew at the point where asset price bubbles within China became the primary concern of economic policy makers. So we see in 2014-2015 the first signs of real crisis and collapse in the real estate bubble as well as the near collapse of the stock market bubble in 2015. And that, I think, led to, to a fear over that that, that said, okay, let, let's prevent the capital account from opening. Right? Because prior to that, there had been moves in the Shanghai free trade area, for example, to try to open up the capital account and allow currency to move more freely sure. in and out, to be more, more openly traded, to widen the trading band of the renminbi against that basket of currencies. But I think that stopped. So I think for right now, we're kind of back to where we were 15, 20 years ago when it comes to de-dollarization as an agenda item, rather than where we were, say, five to ten years ago, seven to ten years ago, where I think we were further along the path, actually. We've taken a step back, but it doesn't say we couldn't go the other way. The Arctic, the only thing I would say is that uh, China supports freedom of navigation in all the world's oceans. <laughs> even, those that, even those that aren't navigable. Um, <laughs> No, I mean, again, I, I think that sort of sums up all those points extremely, uh, uh, extremely well. I think I'll end with um, a one-liner, perhaps this is the wrong place to end, but, you know, a kind of teaser of perhaps doing this again mm. some other, other yeah. time. Yeah. If I was going to mention the one question, I was thinking to myself, what's the one question we haven't talked about almost at all today, which might just flare up, not exactly out of nowhere, but to, to, at least from the, the back burner to come and haunt us? And I'm going to plan for North Korea. Because I think there's still stuff happening there, including instability of regime. And quite yeah. what's happening in terms of COVID, COVID there are memories really yeah. terrible. But also the nuclear threats that mean that actually the kind of on-off, on-off sense that China maybe should be able to do something about North Korea, but actually it kind of never does, partly because it's not the major object of North Korea's ire or, or concern. Um, in a way that it suddenly flared up and then suddenly went down during the Trump years for all sorts of reasons that we know. Um, I wouldn't bet against North Korea being yet another problem that raises its head in the really quite near future. So we may yet be back to have that discussion, I yeah. think, as well. I would agree with that. 
we'll see. Uh, hopefully, in any case, hopefully that doesn't happen. But yeah. Hopefully, we will be back to have another discussion before too long. And on that note, thank you all very much for coming out. Um, thank you, Rana, for coming and for wonderful Pleasure. remarks. And uh, do uh, follow our Center uh, for Geopolitics uh, here and uh, look for the website to see uh, future events. And uh, thank you all for your great questions as well. Okay.